All right, Romans 12, this entire chapter kind of gives us a full mindset of how we ought to be thinking and acting and, and things like that. And I'm not going to go through this entire chapter, but as we read, we just read through this whole thing, and there's so many things that are mentioned here, and those are all characteristics and, and traits that we ought to have. And what I'm going to be doing this morning, I'm actually going to be teaching and preaching a sermon uh, that was... There was a question brought up to me, not on whether or not this was right, but just kind of asking, someone asked me in church to, to point them in, in a direction because they were trying to explain to other people um, this, this truth or this concept, this idea, and, and how, to, how to prove it all from Scripture. And what I'm going to be dealing with this morning is, is uh, self-defense in light of the Bible. Self-defense. And this is a really good topic. And I, and I had thought that I had preached like an entire sermon on this before, but it turns out that I didn't. And I, I think it's important enough. It's, it's a good, it's a really good issue to, to devote an entire sermon to this subject. I brought it up in other Bible studies and stuff in the past, but we're going to kind of dive a little bit deeper and look at biblical principles and apply them because Here's the thing, like a lot of things, you know, you'll find that not every single question you could have on what's right, what's wrong, how do we do this, is just going to be explicitly answered in the Bible. Of just, you know, we have a lot of thou shalt and thou shalt nots, right? So when it comes to things that are just flat out in there, it's like, okay, well, that's easy, right? Because it just says it black and white. You don't even have to do any thinking about it. Thou shalt not, you know kill or steal or you know all these things it's like yeah that's that's a no-brainer it's obvious other things though we need to um we need to dig a little bit deeper and get a full proper understanding of the law of the spirit that we ought to have of of many things so we're gonna when we look at this we're gonna look at two things okay one is we're gonna look at the law because th the law is really really important because, first of all, if anything's going contrary to the law, then you know that it's sin and it's not right. However, the law is not where we want to stop because there's also things that go a little bit beyond the law, which is the spirit that we ought to have. So the law allows for certain things where it's not a sin, but it's even when you're following a law, isn't necessarily the best way that you ought to be. If that makes sense. I'll give you an example. An example would be the, um, the exception for, for divorce that's given in Scripture, that the, the law allows for a man to divorce his wife for the cause of fornication. Okay, But that's not really, God doesn't really want you to use that exception to the law he wants you to be able to stay together and you know so the the best thing would be you know from the beginning it was not so god made them you know male and female and for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother shall cleave unto his wife and they two shall be one flesh so that gives us the the teaching of like hey this is what god really wants now there is this aspect of if you you know if you do this you're not sinning okay god made the exception it's it you'd be just in doing it but that still doesn't follow completely in the best way. So it doesn't mean you're, again, there's a difference between sinning and what can I do to be the absolute, kind of be in the right spirit and have the right mindset. It's also similar, we just went through this with dealing with problems with people in church where, you know, if you have a problem with someone, you need to bring it to the church. You know, if, so, if your brother defrauds you, then you could get judgment within the church and the church will make, you know, and obviously you deal with them first and then you bring one or two witnesses and then it goes before the church and then there's a judgment made. But the spirit that's, that's being taught there as well is just, hey, if someone does you wrong, why don't you just suffer it, right? So, so those are the two different things where there's a right process and there's kind of a law to it, but then there's also the mindset of, well, what's the best way to be anyways? Self-defense is going to be something similar. Okay, so we're going to look at the legal aspect of it as far as God's law is concerned. I'm not worried about our, our laws. I'm talking about the law of the Lord. So what would be considered sinful and what's allowed? And then also on top of that, okay, well, I know that I wouldn't be sinning, but is this still the, you know, what's the best way or the right way to handle the situations? And um, 
those are kind of the two main aspects. We're starting off with a principle here in Romans chapter 12. Before we even get into self-defense, it's just in verse number 18, the Bible says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Amen. Dearly beloved, avenge night. Well, I'll get into that in just a minute. So the, the, the first principle is we're not out looking for trouble, right? And we're talking about self-defense, being able to defend yourself. Well, if you're walking with a mindset of just wanting to live peaceably anyways, you know, some people can bring on situations where it still is considered self-defense. But you're not really trying to live peaceably as much as you possibly can with all men, right? Because there's a lot of things that can be said that can provoke, that can put you in a situation where, oh, now I've got to defend myself, right? And we need to start, and that's why I want to go into this, just starting off having the right mindset of not even wanting to get into any altercations or get into a situation where you would have to even deal with defending yourself or defending someone else. And honestly, like I've taken, and, and just so you know where we're going a little bit, I've taken plenty of self-defense classes, okay, quite a few, some martial arts, some gun training. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a believer in you know, being able to defend yourself and carry weapons and things like that. But we're going to get into some of the biblical principles behind that and, and why I have that mindset. But the best training that you're going to get, especially in self-defense, some of the best training that I received uh, went into heavily into the de-escalation and how you talk with people and, and um, being able to completely avoid confrontations to begin with. Because there's so many situations that could be handled verbally and never have to come to anything physical where someone's going to get harmed. And when we keep this mindset of being able to live peaceably with all men, that is the goal, right? So sometimes what this is going to mean is that your pride may get hurt a little bit, but in the idea of living peaceably with all men, you suffer things, you allow things, when people will... will cause names, you know, throw out words to try to provoke you, if you can have the humble and the meek mindset to not allow yourself to get provoked and then start going back and forth and kind of escalate a situation to a point where it's going to get maybe violent or cause you to have to, you know, be forced to defend yourself. The best thing to do in many situations, in almost all situations, is going to be to diffuse a situation. If someone says something, okay, right? Let it be. Because you want to be, why? Because you want to try to live peaceably with all men as much as is possible. You don't need to have conflict. Who cares? At the end of the day, who cares if someone calls you names or someone disrespects you or whatever? It doesn't really matter. And if you're going to take it to a, a, you know, a next level or extreme, it's like, is it really worth going to blows over? Is it really worth, you know, now adding all of this extra hurt and injury and, and potential damage over some things that people are saying. And, and, you know, you think that out in your mind and think it all the way through to make the decision in advance. You know what? If this situation comes up, I'm just going to just let it go. Blow over. Walk away. Right? That is, that's the best. And, and so before we even get into the self-defense part, that's the spirit. That's the mindset that we want to have. And the best teachers will also teach you this as well. The best martial arts training is going to tell you, you know, you're not learning how to fight to go out and be a tough guy and to be a bully and to just see whose butt you could kick. And, do, you know, like that's not the purpose of it at all. And if you know, if you have wisdom, if you have knowledge on being able to deal with situations and defend yourself and you know techniques that is going to allow you to neutralize threats, quickly, great, but don't let that go to your head either to puff up yourself and to start making you get a proud attitude instead of a meek and humble and lowly attitude so you could maintain this spirit of trying to live peaceably with all men. Verse number 19 then continues on about here avenging yourselves because this would be another situation where you might feel like, well, I need to right this wrong and get yourself into a situation 
that would be an altercation that can, that can lead you to, oh, well, I'm defending myself, right? But we need to avoid that as well. The Bible says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the spirit and the mindset that we need to be walking by and living by. Okay? This is the, the great general, hey, this is how I'm going to live my life day to day. And we're going to try this. Now, there's going to be times, there can be times, where even doing as much as you can here isn't enough to prevent you from having to defend yourself because there's evil, wicked people out there that that's what they're set on, is doing harm or, do, you know, whatever. And sometimes having this mindset isn't enough to avoid a confrontation or avoid a situation where you have to defend yourself, right? But this is how we want to as much as we can with the control we have to avoid it altogether. And this is what's right. I mean, this is what the Bible's teaching us to do. Anyways, if we follow this, you'll find yourself not having those situations. So what does the Bible say about defending yourself or others? Um, you know, the principle here is to seek peace. The Bible also talks about not being strikers, not being brawlers, right? And when saying that, that's, that's someone who's more characterized about someone who's, you know, they're a fighter. Right, they're, they're a brawler. This isn't talking about, that's not talking about sport of, of playing games. I mean, this is talking about people who, you know, you know who the type is. We've all seen them. The ones that like just getting into fights with people. Um, oftentimes, alcohol can fuel this as well. If, you, if you're in bar type situations, I don't know where I'm going to, anyone, no one should be, but there's people who will just kind of, that's what they want to do. They're brawlers. They want to start fights. Any little thing. They'll look for reasons for, to get in a fight with people. And um, that's not how we ought to be, right? And don't put yourself in situations where that type of people are around either. That's another way to help you avoid these, uh, these situations. But self-defense in general, that's how I titled the sermon, is a real broad subject because there's lots of ways to defend yourself. And I'm going to start off here just by dealing with the most extreme form, which would be a lethal self-defense, right? Because if we deal with that situation, obviously the things that would be less lethal, it's a lot easier to understand where the limits are. If we could establish limits on when is it okay to take another life in the act of defending yourself? Is it okay? What does the Bible say about that? The rest of it becomes a lot easier to, to, to understand and deal with because... If I have this much extent, if I have the extent to take another person's life in defending myself, then you definitely have the right to use less lethal or less than lethal methods of defending yourself, right? I mean, that's, so that's why we start with that extreme because it already encompasses everything else. Um, turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus 21, we see a lot of the laws regarding killing of another person. And there's multiple situations that are brought up in the scripture. And, and the scripture does, and, and I preach an entire sermon on the death penalty and, and these types of laws. And there's a distinguishing between manslaughter and, you know, first degree murder is the way that we would think of it. Like premeditated, someone's out to kill someone is way different of a crime than something happening by accident. Maybe there's just an accidental death. Or a situation where, you know, a person wasn't trying to kill them. Something happened. They got in a fight or whatever, but, but they, they didn't just have it out to kill them, but they ended up dying anyways. So there's a, a distinguishing factor there. And this would be a situation where if you're defending yourself, right, someone's attacking you or trying to attack your family and you end up killing that person, well, you wouldn't be considered a murderer because you weren't, you didn't have it out to kill that person. You weren't trying to just do harm to that person, but they did end up dying, right, at your hands. So it would still be a killing, which, you know, there's, there's a, such a high value on life that God puts an extremely enormous value on a human life. And for very good reason, right? We, we got the story of, um, you know, if you remember the story of the man that was possessed with the devil, and then Jesus cast out the, with the legion, right, with all the devils, and Jesus cast them out into the swine, and you have all those swine running off down the hill and then dying in the, in the sea. 
and it was worth it. And Jesus was willing to make the sacrifice of however much financial, you know, however much that was worth all those swine's life to, to, you know, to whoever the owner was, that that man's life was more important. His soul was more valuable than all of those swine and however much money that was, right? And that's just one example. Obviously, there's, there's lots, of, uh, lots of, of examples in Scripture just valuing life. So we, we don't want to take this self, lethal self-defense lightly either because it's a big deal, right? I mean, it's, it's taking someone's life, they're, they're gone. They're not coming back. It's done. And it's another situation where you don't, we shouldn't be looking for it. You don't want it to happen. But you know what? There are times where um, even here with the law, we're going to see that if that happens, you're not going to be put to death because the, the death penalty is a sign for people who kill, right, for murderers. But as we see here, look at verse number 12 of Exodus 21. The Bible says, He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. So if you hit somebody you, and you end up killing that person, he says, you know what? You're going to be put to death. But then it goes on to explain, and you could read this in context later. Just, just take note and, and read the whole chapter for yourself. Verse 13 says, And if a man lie not in wait, so he's not like out to get him, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. So this is, that's the manslaughter where he wasn't trying to kill him. It wasn't his intention. It wasn't his motivation. But now he's going to go and, and kind of seek refuge in another area so that that person's family is going to come after him and kind of start this whole uh, back and forth and have a war over this person who died. So, um, and again, I, I went through all that with the death penalty. You could read, or you could go back and find that sermon or just read this chapter for yourself later on. Flip over to chapter 22. So we see there that, you know, there isn't a real punishment for manslaughter other than you just kind of got to get out of that situation with the person who was, who was killed. So when you're, if you're in a situation where you have to defend yourself, your intent is not to kill the person, right? You're not, it's not premeditated. You didn't have it out for them. In most cases where you're going to defend yourself, you probably don't even know the people or whatever, right? It's just some, someone trying to do you harm. Um, there's no punishment on that person's death, on their blood. Even though the value of life is, is high, God still puts this as saying, okay, well, there, you're not going to be punished for that. This, this move, you know, being, going into a city of refuge wasn't a punishment. It was a way to keep order. It's not, you're not being imprisoned. You're not, you know, you're not losing liberty. And it's, and it's just one of the consequences that goes along with, with, a, with an event that is tragic. I mean, it shouldn't, shouldn't happen. People doing that, doing bad things. Um, unfortunately, there's a fallout and that's the best way to deal with it. Now, in Exodus 22, I want to, this is a really important passage to look at because I, I think there may be some people that, that view, that take this a little bit too far in, in their application of it. But let's read the first three verses, of Exodus 22. The Bible says, If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. So this is talking about a thief, right? Verse 2 says, If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall be no blood shed for him. So this is a criminal coming in and he's caught trying to steal and he's, he's smitten so that he dies. The Bible says, you know what, there's no blood shed for him. But then verse 3 says, If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. So what this is implying here is that if he's found at night breaking up, right, and he dies, there's going to be no blood shed for him. But if, if the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. Now, what this is, what the, the situation is talking about is a man stealing an ox or a sheep, right? It's talking about stealing an animal, first of all. An ox or a sheep isn't going to be in your dwelling with you. And people just don't keep oxen and sheep in their residence where you're staying, where you're sleeping, and things like that, right? This is going to be someone coming onto your property, 
and trying to steal. And, and here's the things we need to understand, and we, we, gotta, we gotta think about this and apply the biblical principles, because I don't believe that it's just, well, anyone who breaks into your house in the daytime, if you kill them, then that, you can't do that. But if they're coming in at night, then you can kill them. I, I don't, I don't take, I've heard that before. I don't believe that that's the proper application of this because this isn't talking about someone breaking into your house. So the person who's breaking into your house, you don't know why they're there. They may be coming to steal, but they may be coming to rape. They may be coming to murder. You know, they're coming into the place where you live. It's different than someone breaking into your shed, right, to steal some garden tools or whatever. So if you have someone out on your property trying to steal something in the daytime, you know, you can deal with that situation differently. You're not just gonna, gonna just go to, to killing that person or whatever, but someone that's creeping around at night, you, don't, you, don't always, you can't always see what the motivation is. And you're saying, you know, there's gonna be no blood shed for that person because they may be coming, you know, you don't know. But it's a lot easier to see these things in the daytime and get, and get an understanding of what a person's actually doing you know, and, and it's also not like saying, okay, you've got the green light, just go out with your gun and start shooting people at night. <laughs> if they're on your property, say, if you'd be smitten that he die, you know, there's not going to be any blood shed for him. So we also got to understand too, one of the, what he's saying here is that if the son be risen upon verse three, there should be no blood shed for him. Why? For he should make full restitution because there's not a death penalty on the crime of stealing, right? Thieves, if you're just stealing something, they need to restore and repay. That is the right judgment for a thief and for stealing. But other crimes, right? If someone's coming to murder or rape, those do carry a death penalty sentence. And I think any crime that carries a death penalty sentence already, you're completely justified in taking that person's life to prevent them from doing whatever it is that they're trying to do. If someone's coming to kidnap, right? Or rape, or kill, there is zero doubt in my mind that if, if you're defending yourself from those things and you take that person's life, there would be no blood shed for that person. And I think the reason why it brings up this situation of a thief is that because it adds an element of uncertainty and unknowing that, well, I mean, if you can't see what's going on, it's at night, or, you know, you're trying to check out what's going on and you end up killing that person, there's still gonna be no blood for them, shed for them, even if they were just stealing which isn't a capital crime, you still get that added, you know, no punishment or no penalty at all because, because of that. So there's more to this than just applying it broadly because you got to figure, I mean, an, like I said, an animal's not going to be in your house, right? If someone's breaking into your house in the daytime, how do you know why they're breaking into your house? They may be in there to steal, but they may be in there to do other things. And I would say this too, if someone's got a weapon, then there's, <laughs> there, it's, if someone's breaking into your house with a weapon, you can't assume that they're in there to do anything other than to use that weapon against you. You have to make that assumption. Now, <coughs> these are some areas where the Bible doesn't explicitly talk about this. I'm going to the areas that, that comes as close as possible to a situation like this, but we need to take this all in stride with, with, and, and look at it carefully and not apply too broadly, like in this situation, just, well, just daylight day, or, or darkness and that's it across the board. Well, let's look and see exactly what this is talking about and who this is talking about, because this is talking about a person where it gives us the motivation where someone's just coming to steal. And we already know that it's a person who's just coming to steal stuff. And there's a difference. There's, there's some thieves that are not violent and they don't want to have violence and they don't carry weapons and they just want to steal things and, and they try to do it when people aren't around and they're not carrying guns, they're not carrying weapons. That's a different thief than the person who's going to come in and pull an armed robbery and threaten life and everything else. Those are two different types of people and both exist. So the person who's just trying to steal, which again, obviously it's all wrong, but a person who's just trying to steal, you know, like the Bible says, someone who's hungry and they're stealing to get some food, 
is not the same as someone else who commits a different crime. So all of this needs to be considered and thought about. And honestly, there's just some common sense. And we're going to see some common sense later. I've got that in my notes where there's an element of things that are just understood because a lot of them are just so basic that I think that's one of the reasons why they're not really brought up a whole lot in scriptures because some things are just pretty common. Like, the, like, like doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have a long hair, it's a shame unto him? Like, like isn't that just obvious? And that's just, and, and you know, the Bible itself literally just says that where it's like, hey, that should be obvious to you. And I think a situation where someone's going to come at you with a gun or, you know, threaten you or your family's life, it should be pretty obvious that, yes, you can do that. But we're going to get even further in Scripture and just, and just I'm going to show you where God is allowing and okay with these situations. The law itself even says, hey, there's going to be no bloodshed for him. There's a person's life dying, you know, ending at the hands of someone, you know, who, where they're, they're breaking through and stealing. And the Bible said, you know what? Nope, no punishment for it. You know what that means? It's not a transgression. It's completely justified in God's eyes for that to happen. So there are instances, at the very least, whether or not you agree with my whole analysis of Exodus 22, you have to admit that there are instances where killing another person in defense, in some manner of defense here, defending property or defending life, is allowed according to God's law. That, is, that goes without a doubt. Now, we're also going to look at an example. Turn if you would to 1 Samuel chapter 18. I want to just point this out because I think King David's a pretty good example in general on, on how to live and how to deal with situations, right? Where he applies the spirit, but then also being a godly man, kind of what just looking at his actions. Now, we don't get our primary doctrine just from people's actions in Scripture if you don't know whether or not those actions, right? Because sometimes good people do bad things, right? You can't just say, oh, well, this person had multiple wives, so multiple wives is okay. No, you take the clear teaching, and then we can look at this. And again, it's not that, that Dave, you know, even though David is, is listed as a man after God's own heart, doesn't mean that everything that David did was right. But there are many areas where we can look at examples and we can see principles playing out that is right and that, and that people do get blessed for. And when you see people getting blessed for their heart and their attitude, then you can deduce that, well, what they did was right. First uh, Samuel chapter 18, look at verse number 10. The Bible reads, And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. So here's a situation where David needs to look, use some self-defense. Because Saul's trying to kill him with a, with a weapon, with a javelin. But what did David do? He avoids him. He just gets himself out of that situation. Does he avoid the javelin and then come at him and, and, and try to kill Saul because he tried to kill him? No. He had an opportunity to get away, and he gets away. And I think this is a really good example of how we ought to be peaceably minded that even if someone were to come to you in a situation, if you have an opportunity to get away, take the opportunity to get away and, and eliminate the threat just by physical distance. That's the best way to deal with threats so that you don't have to do it. Now, that's not always an option. Sometimes you may have your family with you or something else and there's a threat coming to you. You can't just leave because you've got to worry about other people that you're protecting, right? So I'm not talking about every situation, but there's also could be a situation where you're by yourself. There's someone that's going to approach you, maybe want to rob you, maybe an armed robber or whatever, and you have an opportunity to get out of there, get out of there, right? It's, just, it's, the, it's, the, it's the right way to be peaceably minded and to get away because at the end of the day, the best thing is just that, you know, no one has to be hurt would be, would be ideal. Um, and then Saul ends up chasing David, right? And we know, we know the story. You read the Bible. And instead of David killing him, he completely just continues to try to avoid the conflict altogether. 
And there's obviously other things at play here. Saul's God's anointed. There's all these other stuff. But at the same time, David's just using this, trying to live peaceably. And just, he, you know, he confronts him a couple times saying, look, what have I done? You know, I'm not sinning against you. Leave me alone. And he has the heart and the attitude of being meek and humble and not taking things personally and not just, you know, going to, to get vengeance on himself where it'd be very easy for a man to do that, saying, oh, you think you're going to kill me? I'm going to kill, you know, and, and having that type of an attitude. David left it in God's hands, which is the right thing to do in a situation like that. Avoid it as much as you can. Now, I think if push came to shove, David would still end up ultimately defending himself if he absolutely had to and was just in that situation. But he does his best to completely avoid it and just let God deal, let God deal with it. Um, and notice this too, turn to, to chapter 21, right? Because this is as David is, is now fleeing. He understands Saul has it out for him. He's conspiring to kill him. He, you know, he hears from Jonathan that, yeah, you know, my dad's trying to kill you. So he decides to leave and he flees and he flees pretty fast, right? So he, he got some of his men together and they end up running. And then he goes to Ahimelech is the priest and he's looking for provision for his soldiers but then look at verse number eight it says and david said unto ahimelech and is there not here under thine hand spear or sword for i have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste and the priest said the sword of goliath the philistine whom thou slewest in the valley of elah behold it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod if thou wilt take that take it for there is no other save that here and david said there is none like that give it me so even though he's avoiding conflict he still makes sure he has a weapon. He's still like, I need a sword. I need, like, I didn't even get a chance to grab my weapons. You got something here. Here you go. Goliath's sword. You have it. He's like, yep, I'll take that. And he takes that with him. He makes sure that he has a weapon. And I'm sorry, Goliath's sword isn't going to be useful. He didn't get it to slice bread with. And he wasn't getting a sword to go hunting with either. They had bows at that time. Bows would be a lot more effective at hunting game when you're on the run than a sword. Okay, so, and, and the people who go hunting know this, right? If you, who's been bow hunting before? I know, I know there's some hands back there been bow hunting. It's not easy to get in proximity of a beast even to use a bow, and a bow is, is a range weapon. I mean, you've, you've got distance. You can cover distance with that weapon to kill an animal. And trying to sneak up on an animal to be able to even use a bow is not easy. Can you imagine trying to get close enough to use a sword? <laughs> We're going to kill this deer with a sword. Like, yeah, good luck. <laughs> I think you're going to go hungry before you're able to use your sword. I mean, unless they have wild boar out there, maybe you could get one and, and provoke him into charging you and you could kill it with a sword or something. But yeah, it's not going to be your, your, your weapon of choice for hunting. It's not what he got it for. It's for defense, right? And if you apply that today, you know, guns, yeah, they're great for hunting, but that's not the only purpose of having a gun. You use them for defense, just like people here would use a sword. Uh, flip over to Psalm 18. We went over this a little bit in our Bible study in Psalms, but... Um, it's good in the context here, in the light of what, what we're preaching here, to understand this as well. Because this is also David speaking. You know, David got this sword. He's running from Saul. He's not trying to have a, conf a confrontation, but he still needs a weapon to be able to defend himself. And this is righteous. And you know what? The priest gives it to him. The priest doesn't say, no, David. You know, you shouldn't have any weapons because it's not right and it's not godly to have a weapon. Because you wouldn't want to accidentally kill somebody with it when you're slicing bread or, or going out hunting. You know, no weapons. No, he gives it to him. He goes, here. He, he, he provides him with the food and he gives him the sword. Here you go. It's completely reasonable to give him a sword. Give him a weapon. Psalm 18, look at verse number 30. Bible reads, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. And again, the mindset of understanding, we see this all throughout Psalms. God is our defense. God is our shield. That's who we're trusting in. First and foremost, our self-defense is really should be trust in God's defense. That's top. That's number one. 
But it doesn't just stop there. There's still things that we can do. You know, the Bible says that, that um, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. So you still have the horse prepared. You still do things. You still walk around, you know, doing what you can do. But at the end of the day, your faith is in God. And as we're going to see continuing through this, this passage, which is where I start in verse 30, hey, God is the defense. God's a buckler. But let's keep reading here. Verse 31, for who is God, save the Lord, or who is a rock, save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. Verse 34, he teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. He's saying, God's the one who made me fast. God's the one who made me strong. And God's the one who allowed me to, to get this knowledge and understanding of how to use these weapons for the purpose that a weapon is made for. I mean, God did that. If God didn't want you ever, ever to, to have to take another life, I mean, he sent people into the promised land. And, it, you know, so obviously there's, there's situations where it is okay to take another person's life. Um, and here we're, we're focusing on just the self-defense aspect. Verse number 35, Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath holden me up. And thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, that my feet did not slip. I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that they were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet, for thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. They cried, but there was none to save them, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out as the dirt in the streets. Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people, and thou hast made me the head of the heathen. A people whom I have not known shall serve me. And obviously, that last verse there is, is um, prophetic of, of Jesus Christ still, but... Um, we have these people rising up against David to do him harm and God giving him the strength to defeat those enemies. And the people that hate him and are coming against him and, and making war with him and God is providing him the strength to kill those people and to defend himself. Now, here's the big question. Turn if you to Matthew chapter 5 because this is where probably the biggest... Um, opposition to what I'm teaching this morning would come from is, well, what about turning the other cheek, right? And look, it, it's important. It needs to be dealt with. But it's also important to, to get more than just one verse in the Bible to get a doctrine and to understand a bigger concept. And it is important. I mean, being able to take someone else's life is it's not something to just be flippant about. And when we're, we're understanding what is r the right thing to do, you can't undo someone's, you know, taking another life. So we need to be real serious in our study over this. It's not just a, a, a flippant study. It's something that we need to consider everything that the scripture has to offer. And obviously there's some meaning behind what Jesus is, is teaching and saying in Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to look at that and see how does this correlate, how does this work with the rest so far with what we've seen in Scripture, that's what we've seen, as well as the, the, the more verses that we're going to turn to. How does it all fit? Because I'll tell you what, there's not a contradiction in Scripture. You can't have one verse saying one thing here, another one saying that there, and it's just, and it's just a total contradiction. Otherwise, it's, it's not the Word of God. And there is no contradiction. You just have to understand how it all works together. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, the Bible says, and in Matthew 5, this is the, the, the portion of Scripture where Jesus is saying, well, you've heard this, but I'm telling you this. You've heard this, but I'm telling you this. And in general, what he's doing is he's kind of applying what's already known and making it even, even more applicable, right? So when he's he, this is also the passage where he brings up well, you've heard, you know, about, basically about adultery, but I tell you, if a woman, you know, if a man looks at a woman, lust after he's committed adultery with her already in his heart, like, you know, he's kind of taking things even further. Verse number 38 here says, you have heard that it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. 
And we're going to go and turn it to Leviticus 24 in just a minute because that's where this is coming from that he's bringing up. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. So how does this fit with everything else that we've seen to this point? And does this mean that if someone approaches you with a gun or with a sword that, well, here, you're going to cut off my, you know, this arm, cut off this arm too, or, cut, you know, like, like, where do you draw the line on this, right? Is this just saying that, that we just, because he says that you resist not evil, does this just mean that no matter what anybody ever does, that you always just give up your life? Well, one, that wouldn't be consistent with everything else that we just saw. It just isn't consistent with the rest of Scripture. That's right. Now, there is meaning to this. Absolutely, there is meaning to this. But this is in a context of what he's talking about here. And a lot of this context has to do back to the principles and the spirit and the heart that we ought to have towards these things. When he brought up an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that's talking about the punishment on the person who does you wrong. Okay, this is, this is literally what he's referring to. Leviticus 24, 19 says, And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. So this would be, you get in a fight with someone, right? Your neighbor, whatever, and they, they, they injure you. Well, the law was saying that, okay, well, if you injure someone, then you're going to have that done to you, right? And, and, and it's, it's, it's a law that makes sense. And there's nothing wrong about the law. So is Jesus just talking bad about the law here or saying the law is no good? He's not saying that. What he's talking about is your attitude then towards someone who transgresses against you. That's what he's talking about. Just exactly like the scripture teaches about if someone you know, defrauds you in the church, you have a right to have that settled and judged in the church, just like a person has the right if someone smites you and they cause you damage to your eye or to your hand or what you know, you have a right, according to the law, to have that punishment given out on that person. We, you know, according to the law. But what he's teaching here is to show mercy and forgiveness against having that penalty or that punishment meted out. Whereas if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. Someone's done you wrong and it ended up in, in an injury or whatever. This is all, this, I do not believe that this breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth is talking about someone who's attempting murder on you. <laughs> right? I mean, it's not. That's not the point of this aspect of the law. This portion of scripture that Jesus is bringing up is talking about how do you rectify and how do you get justice for things that were done wrong to you? If someone, I mean, if someone caused you to, they ended up causing you to lose sight in an eye, right? I mean, you get in a fight with someone and they beat you up and then and all of a sudden, man, you caused my eye to perish. Well, the, according to the law, that's how you, you, you balance the justice is, okay, well, I mean, that, that was extreme. You shouldn't have done that. Now you've, you've got to lose that eye. But what Jesus is teaching is just saying, you know what? Allow, just, just allow it, right? Don't go after them. Don't, you don't have to worry about getting them in trouble and getting, you know, it wouldn't be wrong or a sin to have them punished for what they did because it would be righteous according to the law. But he's trying to teach a spirit and an attitude that just allows you to, to show mercy and forgiveness. That's what he's doing here. This is different. This is not a situation of somebody attempting to take your life or threatening to kill you where you're turning the other cheek to let them kill you. That is not what's being taught here. Okay, that's a different situation.
Turn, if you would, to Luke 22. And here's, you know, this is going to, in my mind, just proves it beyond a shadow of a doubt because Jesus is the one teaching in Matthew chapter 5 to turn the other cheek. Well, we're going to see what Jesus also said after what he said in Matthew chapter 5 to his disciples in Luke 22. Luke 22, we're going to start reading in verse number 35, where the Bible reads, And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. And if you remember, earlier in his ministry, he's saying, you know what? Don't take two coats. You know, you're just going to go out. You're going to preach the gospel. You don't need any money. You don't need anything. Just, you know, when you go up to a city, find out who in it is worthy, and you're going to stay there, and you're going to do this work, and you don't need anything. You're going to be taken care of, right? And he was teaching them, you know, obviously lessons. But when he was with them, he's saying, you know what? You don't need anything. You just go out and do this. Now Jesus is about to be crucified. He's about to be arrested and taken from them and everything else. And he's saying, you know what? When I did that before, you didn't lack anything, did you? But now, look what he says in verse 36. He says, then said he unto them, but now. So is he changing something a little bit? He is. You know, before, you didn't need anything at all. You didn't even need any money. Just go out and just do what I'm telling you to do. Do it by faith. You'll be taken care of. And he taught them that. And he taught them to live by faith. But now things are changing. Now he's going to be leaving them. Now they're going to be left, you know, as it were, on their own. Of course they're going to have the Holy, Go the, you know, the Holy Ghost come, the Comforter, and he's going to help them. It's not that Jesus is just leaving them completely, but in the world he was leaving them. Physically he was in the world with them. He also, when Jesus was physically in the world, you know, as he said unto the Father, you know, all that you've given unto me, that he's kept, right? So Jesus as the good shepherd was watching out for his disciples too. And I think physically, like he was making sure that they were cared for and not harmed when he was with them on the earth. And now he's saying, you know what? Now I'm going to be leaving. But now he says, now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So now he's bringing up a sword. Why is he telling someone to, and, and, and the importance on this is also can't be understated as well. Because if you, he says, if you don't have a sword, sell your garment so that you can have a sword. Putting an emphasis on making sure you got a sword to the extent of, you know, a garment is very precious, especially, you know, in these days. You didn't have all the Chinese factories and the textile plants, you know, just pumping out all this cheap cotton made, you know, whatever materials so that everyone's got all these wardrobes is a lot more valuable when you have the hand stitched clothing and, and you have these garments and oftentimes you'll see people who were poor that didn't they only had like one garment and you can see that when it's talking about um, being sureties for debt and things like that where it's like they're giving their only piece of clothing for that it was a valuable thing and even the the rewards that um with, with name in the Syrian, he was going to give them, you know, this change of garments. It, it was something, he brought gold, silver, and change of garments, right? It's like, you got these precious metals, and then having these garments was also something that was highly valuable as gold and silver was. So what Jesus is saying here, he's saying, let him sell his garment in order to buy a sword, which also can give you the value of garments. I mean, if you could... I, I can't sell my shirt <laughs> to get a gun today, right? Or even a sword. Like it, uh, that value isn't the same as it was back then. But then you, you can see that obviously if you sold your garment, you'd have enough money to buy a sword. So that's what he's instructing them to do. No, you really need to have this. And go with your, you go with your money. Go, what do you tell them? Go prepared. Go prepared. I told you before, you didn't have to have anything. You could just go and do it and, and, and everything was fine and everything worked out for you. But now I'm going to be leaving and now I want you to be able to just, just ha take preparation, bring your, your, your pocketbook with you, bring some money and have a sword. He's not telling them to have a sword to, again, it's not to slice bread with. You get a butter knife for that. You don't need a, you don't need a sword to do that job. And then he says, for I say unto you, 
that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. So that's why he's telling them, because he's going to be crucified. That's why now they need to have a sword, because he's going to be put to death. Verse 38, and they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it's enough. Great. You got two swords. Good. It's all you need. You know, you don't have to, you don't have, to have a whole arsenal. He's not saying stock up and just have every form of weapon and then you'll be okay and able to defend yourself. Now, he didn't say you can't have a bunch of swords, but he just said two's enough. Right? Nothing wrong with having a few extra, <laughs> but, but it's not necessary, right? There's a need. You're saying, okay, the, the, all you need is to be able to have, you know, one or two swords, great. Um, it's enough. But that's out of the mouth of Jesus. So why would he instruct his disciples to carry a sword if in every situation the right thing to do is just to allow all manner of evil to just happen unto you and not resist and not do anything. It wouldn't make any sense at all. Totally contradictory. Allow all manner of evil, no matter the situation, to happen unto you. If someone's just going to come to you and kill you, just go, here you go. Go ahead, you can slice my throat wide open. I'll help you out here. What do we need a sword for? Oh, you could just stay there. I got a sword. I'll just, I'll just do it myself. It's just so you could be extra nice and kind. That's not why. <laughs> okay? Because what Jesus was teaching in Matthew chapter 5 was for specific circumstances. It, he was referring to a portion of the law where judgment is being passed on someone who had done you wrong, and it wasn't because they were trying to kill you and it wasn't anything like that. It was just an altercation with someone that might have gotten a little bit out of hand, a fight, that... Look, those things happen. And, you know, these days, you never even know with fights because people are just crazy and carry all these weapons around with them and stuff. But it wasn't that abnormal for people to get into just fights when they would have a conflict with someone. Not saying that's the right way or the best way to deal with things, but, like, even in our country, there used to be a day where, like, you could get in fights with people and not have a threat of, like, losing your life. Right? There wasn't the mindset of like, oh, if I get in a fight with someone, I'm just going to be killed. Right? And unfortunately today, just because there's been so much sin and, and things have just gotten so much worse, now if someone's going to fight, like someone you don't know is going to fight, like, like, there's a very good chance that they may just kill you or try to kill you. It's sad and unfortunate. Things weren't always that way. But, um, you know, you got to deal with the situation as it stands. And, you know, this is also the reason why God made judges of the law, to be able to make the proper application according to what the law says and be able to apply and say, yep, no, obviously we have these situations where someone, you know, someone dies as a result of someone defending themselves and there's no judgment penalty made. So if someone's coming against you and you're just defending your life, you're defending your family and their life is taken, it is what it is. There's going to be no judgment or punishment against those people. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 26. So this is Luke 22. We saw where Jesus instructed them to take a sword. Matthew 26 is a parallel passage with Luke 22. So it's, it's at the same time frame because he instructed them to take a sword right before the Garden of Gethsemane where he's arrested now, in, in, in the, the way that things are happening in Luke 22. Okay, Matthew 26, now we're going to see him get arrested. And I, I, the reason I'm going here is because I also want to say, I just want to bring up this one verse that other people might try to use to say that, no, no, it's still not right to take someone else's life because, it, you know, whatever. And, and, and we're going to look at this real quickly. Um, verse number 50 in Matthew 26. Bible reads, And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? He's talking to Judas. Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them, which were with Jesus, stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. We know that that was Peter from another gospel where he slices off his ear. Peter, Peter was carrying a sword with Jesus because Jesus already told him, hey, make sure you got a sword. So hey, Peter made sure he had a sword. 
And it's understandable if you just think about the, you know, if you were there with Jesus or whatever, why you'd want to do that. I mean, you're trying to protect Jesus. Okay, well, we're going to fight then and make sure that, that they're not going to come and just take him because they knew that Jesus didn't do anything wrong. Now, Jesus tells him no, right? Why? Why does he tell him no? Don't take, because there's so many reasons why, but, but it wasn't, you know, it, this was his time. This is what he came to do. He knew the prophecy had to be fulfilled. He knew he had to go to die. He knew he was going to the cross. So this wasn't why he was telling him to bring the sword. It wasn't just for that moment. Because he even tells him it's not, he says in verse 52 then, then Jesus said unto him, put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. And this is a phrase too that people are going to want to use and say, oh, see, look, if you, if you just carry a sword, you're just going to die by the sword and that's just the way it is. There's a teaching going on here, absolutely, and he said this for a good reason. And, you know, we kind of will commonly use a fr you know, phrase, you know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And, and there's truth to that. I mean, if you're always just, just pulling out your weapon and getting into fights, it's going to come back on you one day, too. Okay, that's, that's just a, a kind of reaping what you sow to the way that the world works. This wasn't the right time either for Peter to be pulling out the sword and slicing off people's ears. This was not the threat of Jesus losing his life. He was going to be arrested and brought before a council. So I also don't think it's right if you, you know, just to start pulling out your weapons against the cops, like if they're going to arrest you and just be like, no, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm going to, you know, like you're not taking me. There's things that are being done here. It, was, it wasn't appropriate for Peter to just pull out the sword, as Jesus said. You know, he was ready to fight. His heart was in the right place, but he wasn't doing it right. If he was doing it right, then Jesus wouldn't have said anything to him. He obviously told him to carry a sword for a purpose, but this wasn't that purpose. It wasn't for this instance where Jesus is being arrested. And we could take this and apply it as it will, but you still can't get around the fact that Jesus is telling him to carry a sword with him. <laughs> Just because this wasn't the instance doesn't mean that there's, well, then there must be no instance where you use it. And he just told him to carry a sword just so that he could, you know, be more physically fit because carrying a sword is heavy and, and you know, whatever. Like there's some stupid reason to carry a sword. Uh, verse 53, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. So he's also explaining to Peter, like, look, you don't have to defend me. <laughs> I could... I could, I, I've got, you know, a father in heaven that's going to, like, I could ask him and I could have 12 legions of angels. Right? Don't, don't worry about me. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? In that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you laid no hold on me. And one other thing I just want to point out here too is that he's likening his arrest with a thief, but notice he says, a thief being taken with swords and staves. So people treating a thief as being a dangerous person. Which is also a reason why there's no blood shed for the thief who's breaking up in the night. Now, obviously, if you can control the situation and, and handle it in the daytime, whatever, you kind of see what's going on, that the right thing to do is to, is to just handle it and not, you know, just take their life. But, a thief is obviously, he's, I mean, this is just general knowledge that when you're coming to apprehend a thief, you're going to have some weapons that help you apprehend that thief. Now, just as here, they didn't just use the swords and staves on him, they did, but they had him ready in order to arrest him. And the same thing would be done with a thief, too. And I just, just as we were talking about thieves earlier, you know, that, that, they can be very dangerous people, right? Also, thieves, if people are stealing for need, they can be very desperate, too, and, and desperate people end up doing desperate things. So you need to be aware of that as well. And that's another reason why it's, you know, again, it would fall into a category of being um, acceptable according to the law to, you know, if you had to defend yourself because a thief is trying to, to harm you then and to do whatever, then... It, it, it is what it is. Now, uh, Luke 12, the last place we're going to be turned, look at Luke 12.
Because ultimately, I think it's just common sense that you wouldn't allow bad things to happen to you, especially if you knew they were going to happen. If you know someone's going to do something bad to you, it's common sense that you're just going to try to do something to stop it. And this is stated in Luke 12 and Matthew 24, where Luke 12, 39, it says, And this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. So he's using the common sense understanding that if you knew someone was going to break in your house, you'd make sure that they didn't. Right? Everybody knows that. And he's using that truth to talk about the coming of the Son of Man so you could be ready for it. But the teaching here is that there's nothing wrong and it's common sense that if you knew there's a threat and if, you know, you would do what you can to be prepared to stop the threat, to stop, you know, to, to protect yourself and to keep yourself safe and to keep your goods safe and to not have to have those problems. So if you knew that someone can come to you and, and harm you, be prepared. Be ready for it. Be able to defend yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. And if you knew someone was going to, you know, like, do take the proper steps and precautions to make sure that you are not, you're going to allow, not allow that to happen. It's common sense. And lastly, you know, parents are respons responsible for the safety of their children. So a lot of this we're talking about, we're thinking about like one person, maybe someone coming to you uh, individually. And we talked about, you know, the right attitude is just to get away, be able to avoid the situation altogether. But when it comes to the safety of your children, that job of protecting them and nurturing them and raising them is given to the parents. And if someone's coming into your household, parents, you know, you need to be able to keep your family safe. You need to be able to keep your wife safe and keep your children safe. And if that means that someone who's breaking into your house ends up losing their life, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, we don't want, we're not going out to actively, you know, if people come into your house, it's different than you going out and trying to kill someone. And if you can deal with the situation without having to, to become lethal, that would be the best way to go. But that's not always the case. There is a time for a sword. There is a time to kill. There is a time for these situations. It's just understanding them appropriately and it's perfectly reasonable and common sense to use whatever force is necessary to be able to protect the lives of yourself and your family. Because, and, and think about this, you know, people want to say, oh, but you know, you need to be pacifist because life is important. Well, if it comes down to your life or their life, someone's going to die. I mean, if someone's going to kill you, what are you saying then? Like that my life isn't important then? Or my child's life isn't important? No, of course it is. How about the person who's trying to take the life, their life would be the one that should end than the one who's not doing harm or evil to anyone else if one of the lives has to be taken. The aggressor is going to be the one who's going to go. There should be no qualms about using lethal defense when people are going to come at you and do something where it's going to, it's going to, you know, you could possibly lose your life with. There's nothing wrong with that in scripture. And then, of course, every other means of defense. If you can do it, great. If you could, if you could incapacitate people without killing them, awesome. Even better. And that's why I think it's great when people take, you know, martial arts, you know, BJJ, whatever, different things where you can learn how to deal with situations and deal with threats and you don't end up killing them, that's ideal. That's great. If you could learn those, those techniques, even better. And it also allows you to be able to defend yourself, defend your family better when you know those things. But there's nothing wrong in defending yourself and taking another life. It's, it's the only consistent way that you can, you can keep, you know, have all the scripture make sense that we looked at this morning. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, giving us the wisdom given in your word. I pray that you would please just uh, help us to be able to make um, appropriate applications so that we can um, just do what's right. We, we don't want to be in error, Lord, and, and we want to be able to follow uh, according to the Spirit what, what we ought to be doing the best possible way. And... Um, 
Lord, I pray that, that this sermon would, would help people here and, and help others who might end up hearing it later, Lord, to, to just know the truth about this doctrine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.